This video demonstrates the microsurgical resection of a multiple giant glomus tumors, also called of paragangliomas. The patient was a 39-year-old male presenting with headache, vertigo, and tinnitus, associated with left facial and lower cranial nerves palsy. And here we can observe a bulging area in the left upper part of neck. Preoperative MRI demonstrated two large masses, one related to the left carotid artery in the neck, and the other emerging from the left jugular foramen. The lesions were highly suggestive of a carotid body and glomus jugular paragangliomas. The cervical mass was related to the left carotid bifurcation and both internal and external carotid arteries. The other mass emerged from the left jugular foramen and also intradural extension toward the cerebellopontine angle is observed, besides the involvement of the sigmoid sinus and the jugular bulb and the close contact with the petrous internal carotid artery. In these CT scans, we can see the bone erosion around the left jugular foramen, common feature of the glomus jugular tumors, and observe involvement of the carotid, the internal auditory, and hypoglossal canals, besides the middle ear. Now we observe the mass through the brain window CT scan. Here we review some anatomical aspects of the case, considering that a posterior transtemporal approach will be employed. The retroricular C-shaped incisions to be performed is demonstrated. The external acoustic mitus was sectioned because there was tumor involved in the middle ear. The sternocleidomastoid muscle is detached together with the temporalis fascia, in order to help later in the skull base reconstruction. We can observe the accessory nerve running in the lateral wall of the internal jugular vein, and the hypoglossal nerve lateral to the carotid artery. The posterior belly of the gastric muscle is detached and reflected, and we can identify the facial nerve exiting from the stylomastoid foramen. Here we have a close view identifying the rectus capsis lateralis muscle, forming the posterior border of the jugular foramen, and the facial nerve and the stylomastoid artery. A heterolabinitino mastoidectomy is performed, and the sigmoid sinus and jugular bulb are skeletonized, as well the facial nerve and the semicircular canals. The mastoid antrum is also visible, and we should note that it gives access to the eustachian tube. The mastoid tip is removed to expose the jugular foramen. We also should pay attention to the internal carotid artery in the carotid canal, just in front of the jugular vein. And here we have a close view of this relationship. Also, it's important to comment that treating the facial recess, a space located between the facial nerve and corda tympani, it gives access to the tympanic cavity. Here, the upper part of the jugular vein is removed. So we note that hidden by the medial wall of the vein, there are the 9, 10, and 11 cranial nerves, so that this area should be spared if the nerves are functionally preserved. We observe in the medial wall of the jugular bulb that many veins drain into it, as the inferior petrosal sinus and condylar emissary vein. Initially, there was not an easily identifiable cleavage plane between the tumor and the internal carotid artery. So we started to perform a subadventitial dissection in order to dissect the tumor from the internal carotid artery. And vessel control of the internal, external, and common carotid artery is obtained since the beginning of the procedure. The devascularization of this lesion is provided when dissecting it, especially when working around the carotid bifurcation. Now, with suitable vessels control, we can continue the dissection of the tumor from the carotid artery, and progressively we can find the cleavage plane. Here we continue to separate the internal carotid artery from the mass, and now we dissect in an upper extension. The tumor is being dissected in its deeper part, in order to provide a circumferential approach. During the section, we can observe that these lesions are highly vascularized, as in this case. And after completely release the tumor from its attachment, it can be now safely removed. We have exposed now the common internal and external carotid arteries, and see the hypoglossal nerve coursing lateral to the carotid artery, and giving its branch to the ansa cervicalis. So here we can observe the removal of the lesion in block. We observe the internal jugular vein, 
and the facial vein is exposed and need to be sectioned in order to achieve a suitable exposure of the carotid bifurcation. We prefer to approach the jugular foramen lesion in the same procedure and the mastoidectomy is performed exposing the mastoid antrum. The sigmoid sinus and jugular bulb as the facial nerve are skeletonized. As these lesions infiltrate the venous structures around the foramen, the sigmoid sinus is ligated. We observe the tumor in the extradural space and start to dissect it from the dura. We also need to sit to expose the facial nerve, especially considering the preoperative facial palsy. Here we opened the facial recess and could reach the tympanic cavity. We are dissecting the lesion in a heterofacial orientation and the facial nerve is further skeletonized. The tumor dissection from the dura progressed, so here we can already see the lesion being better exposed. And as we can see here, this is also a highly vascularized lesion. The facial nerve continues to be carefully skeletonized. And now we coagulate bleeding from the tumor in the tympanic cavity. Now we observe the mastoid tip drilled that will be removed in order to achieve better exposure of the jugular foramen region and internal jugular vein. And here we cut the posterior belly of the digastric muscle. The tumor below the facial nerve continues to be dissected. This is a highly vascularized lesion, so beyond section in its adhesions, it is necessary frequent surface coagulation. Here, the dura is open and release CSF for brain relaxation. The internal jugular vein is ligated. is open and we can see the tumor protruding inside. So we progress to open the vein toward the sigmoid sinus. Gradually the internal jugular vein is incised in order to better expose the lesion and enable a circumferential dissection of it inside the vein. As the dissection of the lesion progressed, bleeding, especially from the inferior petrosal sinus, starts to appear. Then the lesion is being dissected and detached until be released. This part of the tumor protruding inside the internal jugular vein came from the extradural lesion, and after releasing its adhesions to the jugular vein, it was removed from inside the vein, remaining attached to the extradural lesion. So now the extradural tumor and the segment that protruded inside the jugular vein are removed in block. Now we perform the dural opening in order to remove the lesion that extended it intradurally. As the dissection progressed, we can see the vertebral artery Progressively, the compromised dura is being sectioned in order to be removed together with the lesion. The arachnoid is preserved to protect the neurovascular structures. The tumor extending toward the petrous internal carotid artery was gradually dissected. This part of the tumor was also attached to a segment in the tympanic cavity. Here we remove the tumor involving the tympanic cavity and extending toward the internal auditory canal. Then this piece is being progressively detached. So these lesions were carefully resected and were removed together.
here the last adhesions to the dura are sectioned in order to free the lesions to be removed. In this case, as the lower cranial nerves were already preoperatively damaged and they were involved by tumor both in the jugular foramen and in the neck, the preservation of the medial internal wall of the jugular vein is not necessary. And now the medial wall of the internal jugular vein infiltrated with tumor is dissected to be removed. And we see pulsate in the petrous internal carotid artery. Now the tumor involving the facial nerve is carefully dissected and removed, remaining a tiny nerve. Then a graft from the greater auricular nerve is tucked. Then the greater auricular nerve graft covers the facial nerve with a hemostatic plus fibrin glue covering them. The eustachian tube is obliterated with fat through the mastoid antrum. Closure is performed with watertight dural suture using the temporalis fascia attached to the sternocleidomastoid muscle and covered with abdominal fat. The muscle layers are repositioned to the anatomical position and the sternocleidomastoid is then sutured to the temporalis muscle. Postoperative MRI demonstrated a complete tumor resection. Pathology confirmed both lesions to be paragangliomas. The patient's neurological status remained stable as the preoperative period, remaining with the facial and lower cranial nerves palsy, but improving the other complaints.